Welcome everyone. My name is Jossie C. Chisley and I have the proud, very proud and distinct privilege to bring to you today the Elevate Med Black Men in Medicine panel discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I know many of you have just watched, I think, a very powerful, extremely powerful uh, documentary uh, from Dr. Okoro Dudu, uh, who is just a, a, an amazing force uh, in medicine and has done so much. And we'll get to him in a second. Uh, just a little bit of background about me. Uh, I'm joined by a, a very esteemed panel, but wanted to introduce myself. Uh, I've been in healthcare now for roughly 25 years, um, and it has been certainly a journey. Uh, from consulting to FQHCs. Uh, I've run many health systems throughout the country, namely in Atlanta, Chicago, uh, Cincinnati, and Memphis. Uh, I've also uh, worked as uh, the chief strategy officer for the second largest uh, insurance company in the country, which is United Healthcare, uh, only second to obviously CMS, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services uh, for North America. And uh, currently I have my, my own firm, uh, my own private equity firm, uh, that's backed by several investors, uh, of which I uh, only invest in healthcare companies and innovation. Uh, most recently, I, I published a book um, that is called Healthy Disruption, uh, The Benefit and Burden of a Black Healthcare Executive in America. Uh, it's wherever books are sold. Uh, and it is apropos and, and completely aligned with, with the topic that we'll be discussing today. Uh, one of my uh, I think most esteemed and, and I think most uh, what I'm most proudful about is serving as a founding board member for Elevate Med. Um, Elevate Med since its inception in 2018 has done just a remarkable job uh, serving medical students uh, from diverse backgrounds uh, and making sure that they are matriculating into medicine with the right tools, uh, with the right mentorship and the right support. And that's something that's needed, especially for African-Americans. Uh, that also being said, I'm, I'm honored um, to be part of this organization that has literally funded over $300,000 since 2019 to worthy students uh, for medical, stu medical school in their studies. Uh, that is re absolutely remarkable. I'd be remiss in giving a night if I didn't give a great big shout out to uh, our founders and fearless leaders of Elevate Med, um, Drs. Alex Porter and Dr. Greg uh, Umphreys. Uh, the Umphreys are fearless leaders in this in this regard and have stu uh, started this organization pretty organically uh, with, a, with a thought and notion to really make sure that we're serving uh, populations and doing something about the uh, very uh, distinct lack of diversity that occurs uh, throughout the, the medical field. That also being said, uh, we've had, uh, again, a little bit about uh, black men in white coats. Again, the, the documentary that we'll be discussing today from Dr. Dale uh, Okorodu Dudu, uh, we are really, really proud about his work and uh, really proud to be uh, partnering with him. In 2013, he started Black Men in White Coats uh, with the notion to create an opportunity for to highlight and expose some of the lack of diversity that occurs in medicine um, throughout, uh, throughout the country and for generations that has occurred throughout generations. Um, he is a driving force. Uh, again, he the 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 documentary did not only resonate with me, but I think it resonated many with you because it's relevant. And if you're a black man, as I am, it's it's certainly relatable. That also being said, um, most recently, Elevate Med hosted its inaugural um, explosion uh, of a dream in Scottsdale, um, Arizona, this 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 past month, actually last month, and it was just a, a remarkable event. Uh, and we were honored and uh, quite privileged to uh, honor Dr. Uh, Dale uh, Okorodu, who, uh, who again founded Black Men in White Coats to really get to the core of the lack of diversity in medicine. Uh, and he was our esteemed Breaking Barriers Distinction Award nominee and actually won that, that award. So, uh, so proud of him. Um, but getting to the actual film, fewer Black men applied to medical school in 2014 than they did in, two, in 1978. Uh, that is a staggering statistic, in my opinion, with less than 2% uh, of African uh, American doctors being black men. <clears throat> this comes as no surprise. The documentary dissects the systematic and systemic barriers preventing black men from becoming medical doctors and the consequences of society at large. Uh, the film was um, executive produced by, again, Dr. Dale and released in 2020. 
Uh, it is actually making its rounds and a, a lot of panel discussions like these are occurring that you can find on YouTube and, and the such. Uh, speaking of breaking barriers though, and, and just being forces of nature in the medical field, I am joined by a very esteemed panel that I'd like to introduce and sort of get their take uh, and perspective on, on not only the film, but also being a, a African-American physician in this country. First, we have uh, Dr. Andrew Sanderson. Uh, Dr. Sanderson uh, resides in DC. He's a GI doc. Uh, he is also a Morehouse brother, proud uh, Morehouse brother. Uh, I too went to Morehouse, so there, there you go. Uh, he received his, uh, his MD from Howard and has a master's degree, master degree in uh, MPH from, uh, from Harvard. Uh, so, so welcome, Dr. Sanderson. Uh, Dr. Brian Hardaway is a cardiologist uh, now working at the Bale Clinic in Arizona. Uh, he is a proud graduate of Alcorn State, also another HBCU, has his doctorate from the University of Tennessee in Memphis, where I actually spent some time as well. And he did his residency at University of Michigan. So uh, I am too an alum of University of Michigan, so go blue and they're actually winning uh, yeah. against Penn State as we speak. So uh, that's a good thing. <laughs> Next, we have uh, Dr. Kalanji Cole. Uh, Dr. Cole is uh, is an internal medicine resident uh, at the University of Texas Southwestern. He graduated from Florida State, and he was actually one of our inaugural uh, recipients uh, in the first cohort of Elevate, Elevate Med Scholars uh, in 2020. So welcome to uh, Dr. Cole. And last but certainly not least, we have our student doctor here, Jordan Edwards. Uh, he is now at the Charles Drew in UCLA uh, Medical Education Program in LA. He's a graduate of uh, the University of Florida, so he's a Gator, uh, and he was selected as a member of the 2021 Elevate Med Scholars Program as well. So we uh, have a wonderful, wonderful panel. Can't wait to get into the discussion. Gentlemen, you guys ready? Oh, yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I'm going to start with our student doctor, if, if you guys don't mind. And I'd love for Jordan to kind of just give us uh, in detail some of the things that resonated with you with the documentary, Jordan, if you don't mind. And then whatever I forgot about your background that you'd like to espouse. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's great to be here. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, a few things that resonated with me with the documentary is specifically a quote from Dr. Dale. Um, he said, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're never going to be on the menu. And that really was something to me that stood out to me and made me so grateful of organizations like Elevate Med for having these events where it gives us a voice and it gives us a space to talk about these issues that are so important. And um, yeah, it's great to be here. And, you know, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Jordan. Appreciate you. Um, Dr. Cole. How about you? What what resonated uh, in the film with you? Um, and uh, any tell us anything else you'd like to share about your background? Um, absolutely. So I like how the film uh, started out by comparing the fact that black men have the worst health outcomes you know, in the nation. And we also are the least represented in medicine. I mean, I think that is the core um, of the problem. Um, and it's and, and it's such a huge problem. Another thing that resonated with me was um, how you know you can't be what you can't see. And uh, throughout the movie, um, Dr. Dr. Uh, Okokoro Dudu um, makes a point um, that you know you have to be visible. So I've been trying to do that you know as much as I can, um, whether that's uh, just like telling people what I do via social media um, to say that you know you can you can do this. You know I know that I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you know me seeing. Um, other black men uh, do it. I didn't have a, a black doctor of my own growing up, but you know I was fortunate enough to get uh, paired with a uh, with a mentor, a uh, black medical student. Um, he was a medical student when I was uh, in middle school. This was actually part of the uh, Stride program um, at at Florida State. Um, so I think this is um, I'm so honored to be uh, on this panel. I can't wait to uh, to dive into the discussion. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Cole. Appreciate it. And uh, I know you know this just uh, from sports and I played uh, basketball at Morehouse, but the best ability is availability. So I think that's exactly what you're saying. So appreciate that. How about you, Dr. Hotteroy? Uh, what, what, what say you and what resonated about the film uh, in your regard? This is the piggyback on what Dr. Cole just said. You have to be visible. Um, my main takeaway is that we have to really utilize our circles of influence, big or small, to really raise, raise awareness 
about the issues that concern us because if it's not us, then who's going to do it? It's also good to see my, my, my classmate, my med school classmate, Dr. Anderson, Otis Anderson, in the documentary too. So good to see him represented. And, and I'm sure that that is uh, one of the beautiful aspects about the film. And maybe one of the sad ones too, Dr. Hardaway, I'll let you opine here in a second, is that I know a lot of you know people that were in the film because you know the, the community is so small. The sad part is the community is so small, so. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. And sir, last but certainly not least, uh, Andrew, how are you, man? Uh, good to see you again. Uh, what resonated with you in the film? Well, definitely good to see you too, Jossie. Um, I'll tell you, it was very powerful. Um, and for me, somebody who's uh, been out of medical school for 20 years, um, I worked at the Office of Minority Health uh, as a medical officer there. So I know all about the data and statistics. But yet and still, uh, this film not only hit on all of those statistics, but it put the personalization there. Um, and really, you know, toward the end, even with the, the uh, young man trip, uh, was pulling at my heartstrings. Um, one of the things that, you know, was instilled in me by my family was that too much is given, uh, much is required. And so I think the fact that we're having this discussion that black men uh, with white coats are uh, doing everything they can to pull this uh, younger generation up uh, is so important. And so this film is really timely. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for your time, your perspective. Uh, I'm ready to get into it as well. So just to kind of start off um, throughout the film, I think the premise was, you know, who who's actually responsible for the lack of diversity? Who can we sort of point to um, if anybody or several parties are complicit and what happened and what is occurring in medicine on why we have such a huge chasm between sort of white counterparts and diversity and African-Americans, particularly men in this country that are actually going into medicine. But um, what are your thoughts there? I, I'd love to maybe start with you, Andrew, um, just to kind of get a sense of what what is sort of, what, what do you think that the pain is and where does it start and how do we address it? Yeah. Well, I, I think if we're going to look in one place, in one area, we have to look at the educational system. And so you can talk about systemic racism. Uh, you can talk about the man. Uh, but the bottom line is that who is investing in our children? Who's investing the resources uh, in this next generation? Uh, a lot of times uh, my family members told me that one of the worst things that could have happened to us as a people was integration. And I said, how could integration be one of the worst things that happened to us? Well, it took a lot of students from uh, black teachers who cared and invested in those students who were supportive of them and challenged them and put them in environments where people really didn't care a whole lot about them. In the film, you know, they said uh, that they were kids who were just trying to be kids. And because of that useful energy, they end up yeah. in uh, they end up in the uh, principal's office. And so I think at every stage, whether it be a college kid who wants to be a physician and the you know college counselor is dissuading them uh, or you know their kids in high school who are not being challenged enough to take more rigorous courses education has got to be um, you know the the focal point I think in, in all the levels on the way up to try to become a physician that's that's lovely uh, well said well said dr. Sanderson appreciate it how about you dr. Hardaway what do you think um, where where's the, the the biggest pain point and how do we address it I think there's plenty of pain points uh, to go around but I think being more visible in and about our communities not only being visible but being uh, accessible someone needs to be able to pick up the phone get on the computer email me reach out grab me on the shoulder and say hey dr. Hardaway I'm interested in a career in medicine, can you help me out? But not only being visible and accessible, we also have to be available. We have to open up our schedules. You know, as physicians, we can be incredibly busy. So we're gonna to have to take time to set aside for activities like this, devoted and dedicated time to do that. The other thing, uh, Dr. Sanderson talked about the, um, education. And I wanna talk specifically about medical uh, education, or at least, physicians who are in academic centers. You know, when opportunities are presented to us to, to sit on boards or committees where we can 
have input in terms of who gets access, who gets admitted to our medical schools and to our residencies, our fellowships, we should leap at the opportunity. A lot of times this is time that's you know taken away from you know our patient care, from, from families, but it's incredibly important. And it may not even be um, uh, academically, um, uh, uh, it may not help us uh, academically in terms of promotion or what have you, but it's incredibly important that we get on these committees and represent individuals who look like us, who have shared experiences as us, and express to our other committee members uh, the importance of uh, uh, representation from African Americans, especially African American males. Um, I think we as a society need to take a, a deeper dive in terms of the social determinants, in terms of the major limitations, in terms of uh, why African American males are not you know, number one, interested in pursuing medicine or not seeing individuals who look like the members on this panel and, 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 and others in our community to be able to reach out to us and really support them in that decision. So that's my take. Yeah, if I could just jump in just really quickly. Um, I think something uh, that Brian said was really, really important. And one of the things is that and I have an, a background in academic medicine. Um, and one of the things is that when you're looking to be promoted in an institution, a lot of things that they look for are, you know, teaching awards or they look for that you've been publishing papers. And so sometimes uh, uh, African-American faculty members can get kind of held back because they've spent so much time trying to mentor and trying to be on committees so that they can get more people in, in the institution. And so one of the things that what we should try to do is push the um, the leadership in these academic centers to also credit those people who are doing that type of work so that they can get promoted um, because that's an important part you know once you get promoted then you have the opportunity to be in a leadership position so that you can make those decisions absolutely and i agree with um all the insights that have been uh, reflected um, so far, speaking from my position, you know, like, you know, as a resident, I'm just getting, you know, through medical school. So um, a lot of the process uh, is uh, still still feels pretty fresh um, to me. And uh, this this whole kind of conversation reminds me of uh, when they were speaking, you know, in the barbershop and they were talking about who to blame. And it seemed to be kind of a uh, two sides, um, you know, where there's an argument to be made that the uh, medical schools were to blame because, you know, they weren't um, enrolling enough uh, black students. And there was another argument that was being made that was um, that it should be more on the community. The community should do a better job of um, boosting uh, the, you know, the community members, you know, to to apply to medicine. It's a really nuanced question. Um, and it's and personally, you know, I feel like it's hard to uh, blame, you know, one particular person or entity. And this, I mean, it's a, it's a multifactorial um, issue for sure. And I think the, the solution involves, you know, everything that's been reflected, you know, in addition uh, to the community work as well. So, you know, speaking from my experience, I hinted on this a little bit, you know, earlier, um, I was, I, I was introduced, you know, to medicine, you know, through a, through a similar type of a community program. Um, it was called Stride. It was at um, Florida State. And I started when I was uh, late in middle school, about like seventh or eighth grade. And what this program did um, was it took students who might be interested in any field of medicine, whether it was going to be a physician or a veterinarian or a pharmacist. And it said, we want to make sure that you're academically successful first and foremost. So after school, you know, we'll pick you up, we'll take you over to the college campus, uh, we'll pair you with uh, medical students, and we'll help you on your homework, we'll help you study um, for your SAT exams. Um, and that mentorship, uh, you know, started early, early on. Um, and I can tell you, you know, if it wasn't for that program, you know, I would have had such a hard time navigating, um, getting into medicine. Uh, starting as a uh, middle school student, high school student, you already have to be putting in the work. You have to be getting, you know, good grades. You have to be developing um, good habits, and you also have to be very well rounded. I was an athlete um, at that time as well. Um, in college, I had to, you know, get involved in research. Um, in medical school, I had to get. I was doing. Uh, not athletics necessarily, but had to get involved in uh, advocacy. And these are all, you know, kind of key pillars that kind of build um, your candidacy from when you eventually apply to medical school and apply to, to residency. All that to say is that, you know, becoming a doctor is incredibly, incredibly complicated. Um, it's probably, you know, the most 
complicated field I can imagine uh, really getting into. And it has to start so, so early on. So of course, um, medical institutions uh, can say, yeah, we can, you know, enroll, you know, one more, one more, uh, you know, black student at, at each institution. Uh, but the fact of the matter is like, you know, these, you know, these kids need to start getting prepared way, 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 way early on. So, you know, it just, uh, to, to me, it involves, you know, there, there's several layers uh, to, to addressing it. I think that you made a great point and, you know, uh, not to pump your head up too much, but you're the type of individual that's going to do well in those type of programs. And, you know, the, I think one of the fallacies that we have looked at uh, in the past is that notion of a talented 10th. And so there are very talented individuals like you who are going to get to where they need to be no matter what. Um, but there are a whole host of kids who have the potential to get there, but they don't have the direction. I think the, the film mm -hmm. did a great job of pointing that out um, and that we have to get to the middle school age where we can even put it in their heads that they could become a doctor so that they can start trying to put, um, so we can all put things in place to help them navigate the kind of treacherous terrain. There. Well said, well said, Andrew. I too appreciate it, Dr. Cole, your perspective. And we'll get into that in a second. Jordan, have you had an opportunity to kind of opine on where you think the, the pressure points are and how do we fix them? Yeah, sure. Happy to jump in. Um, I, I really agree with what every what um, everybody said so far. Um, I think it is definitely a multifactorial problem that we have here, um, getting more African-Americans, specifically black men, into medical school. Um, and it does start at a very young age. I think that a lot of black men don't necessarily have the support that other people have growing up. And I think that that just puts them behind and um, at a disadvantage when it comes time to apply. I think that a specific thing that could be changed is um, sort of the metrics that are used to admit people into medical school. Um, one of the um, metrics is the MCAT. And while I think test taking is extremely important, um, some admissions committees, they have a minimum MCAT score and then they delete all the applications that don't meet that score. And like I said, while I think academia and um, taking tests is important, um, one eight hour test doesn't necessarily reflect how good of a physician you can be and how empathetic of care you can give to patients. Um, so I think that really changing the structure of, of medical school admissions is, is something that really needs to be thought about. And I think that that would also help the problem that we have um, only 2% of, of black males being physicians. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think there's a distinct and unique um, component to the, the word empathy that, that black men can, can uh, actually attribute to their, their care, uh, the bedside. Um, I, I think black men, black women, those from diverse backgrounds bring their whole self to their care and that resonates with patients. Um, and, and like the film, um, sort of, I guess the premise of the film sort of, uh, sort of outlaid was that if we don't get more black men as physicians, as doctors uh, in the medical field, as healthcare professionals, black people will continue to die. Um, and that is that is something that that certainly resonates with me and I know all of you too. So let's get into a little bit deeper and I want you guys to go really deep on this one. Um, given the, 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 the rigidity, if you will, uh, to actually become a doctor and Dr. Dr. Cole, you mentioned this, uh, so I'm, I'm going to come to you first, um, and everything that's going on with the heterogeneity, the homogeneity of everything else that, you know, how black people in medicine look or how black doctors act a certain way. Uh, give me some instances or what are some ways that, uh, black men in medicine need to understand in order to not necessarily perpetuate that stereotype. Um, it was again intimated in the in the documentary, but I'm interested in your thoughts and your very candid thoughts. And, mm -hmm. and getting to understanding, you know, there's there's always been sort of one set way of actually getting into medicine. Mm -hmm. You mentioned your mentor uh, mm -hmm. at, at Morehouse. You had to be not had to be, but uh, Andrew can attest to this. Usually, you are a biology major, and then you mm -hmm. actually took the MCAT and actually get, got into medical school. I'm interested in some of the ways in which you think 
we can stop that perpetuation of that 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 call it stereotype or that rigidity that it is to actually break into medicine and open it up more for black people and black men in particular to pursue careers in medicine it is a really really interesting question um to, to tackle so i'll say this um first and foremost uh un- I don't want to say necessarily unfortunately, but you do have to be very, very academically sound. You have to have, you know, you have to be able to speak everybody's language and you have to have those solid academic kind of fundamentals at place. And why? Because there's so much more that goes into medicine, as uh, Jordan was saying, than, than, the, uh, than the academics. And there's so much more that goes into patient care than, than the academics. And when what I've found in my experience, and, um, you know, I've been taking care of patients um, for, you know, about the past uh, five months, is that they the patients don't see the MCAT score you know the patients don't see um, the academics the patients see you know you as a as a full person and your whole life experiences um, kind of uh, come through um, in those in those patient interactions you know they don't necessarily see the studying but you have to you know have that studying and you have to have that sound academics not only to understand and you know make sure that you're you know giving um, the, the best care you know possible but also you know to make it so essentially, you know, what, what I'm trying to say is that there is not, and I remember there, this was talked about in the, in the documentary as well, there's not a specific, you know, one type of person or one type of black person, one type of black male um, that, that, gets, that uh, thrives um, in medicine. The, the things that I like, you know, outside of medicine, I find help me drastically um, with patients. I can give you an example. Um, I'm, really, I'm really into sneakers, a lot of black men are, um, are, are, are really into sneakers. And um, when I go in and, I, you know, I'm, and I'm taking care of patients, um, I have been able to make you know, amazing rapport um, you know, with patients because it brings me down to earth. You know, I go in from being you know, this kind of scary person you know, in a white coat to just being kind of, kind of a human. Um, and then you know, that connection is powerful, but I have to also be able to, you know, I can't just you know, be focusing you know, on that. I have to be able to you know, rely um, you know, on, on my academics and, and on my studying and um, to, to make sure that I'm giving them the best care possible. So to kind of, to sum, to sum all of that up, you know, I think it starts, it starts with the academics and it starts with, with being strong there. And then once you're really strong there, then you can take, you know, the other elements, um, of yourself, um, you know, that make you unique and bring that, uh, into the, uh, into healthcare. And I feel like, you know, that's really how you make a uh, great headway um, with patient care. Love it, Kalanji. Thank you, man. Beautiful, beautiful. I too had a mentor that got me into the medical field as well, uh, OBGYN, and he was he was absolutely amazing and just uh, sort of not only the uh, the tutelage, but uh, the care in which he administered not only to his patients but also just to to to, to the community. And I think that's again very distinctive uh, within within the black community, especially. Um, Brian, what what do you think, man? Uh, any any thoughts from your perspective on is there a a very Formal, formulaic um, sort of institution that black men have to subscribe to to break into medicine or what was your plight? I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts. Yeah, um, I think that the era that we find ourselves in now is a lot different um, from the era in which, you know, I graduated uh, from, from undergrad and was trying to get into, into medical school. Back then, uh, the formula was biology pre-med um, and really you try to, the goal was to conform yourself into or mold yourself into what you felt like uh, the majority of institutions uh, would want you to be, right? So in my role now, sitting on an admissions committee for the Mayo Clinic School of Medicine here in Arizona, what I'm finding is that it's more and more common for uh, non-traditional routes. So you'll see engineering majors or uh, humanities uh, majors, uh, people who are listing really, you know, uh, extreme interests, people really being their authentic selves. And the advice that I give to uh, African-Americans, and especially African-American men um, uh, uh, trying to get into med school is to for them to be their authentic selves, right? So you don't want to put yourself in a position where you're pretending to be what a particular med school wants you to be, and then you get there and you're trapped in that mold. You are constantly wearing a mask every time you walk into the building. You're being someone that you are uh, really not, and it really will tear at you. 
So if you are your authentic self and you and someone a medical school or medical schools accept you for who you are, you are much more likely to thrive and to succeed uh, in those situations. Love it, love it. Thank you, Dr. Hardaway. Dr. Sanderson, any thoughts? Well, I have a million thoughts on this topic. Um, <laughs> you know, it, 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 so, uh, Brian, I, I think I'm going to go to your comment first of all. When you say authentic self, um, authentic self for us includes academics, right? And Absolutely. so I, I don't want that to get lost in this. You know, when a medical school looks at a candidate and they say, oh, this person has a 3.5 and this person has a 3.1, like, that doesn't make any difference at all. You have to come up with a threshold. If you're above a certain threshold, that means that you have the intellect to be a physician, period. And then having a holistic admissions process helps you to bring in diversity of thought, you know, diversity of experience, and really create the kind of doctors that you need to see patients. You know, they said in the video, if you wanted to, you know, have the top um, scores, top GPAs, you wouldn't even have to interview anybody, you wouldn't have to bring them in. And so there are many medical schools who are doing an excellent job at using a holistic medical, uh, holistic um, framework to bring in students. And so if you can look, you know, University of Michigan is one of them that um, over the course of decades have admitted, you know, so many more African-American uh, uh, candidates than any than other schools. So if you look at the bottom schools, how do you teach them to do it in a holistic way where they're not looking at a score and just cutting it off. Um, I think you have to make, as uh, um, Dale said in the video, you have to make it cool to be a doctor. And I remember uh, I was an intern at Temple and uh, I was in the emergency room and uh, there was this black kid, he wasn't even my patient. And he's in the emergency room and he saw me with my white coat on and he called me over and he said, hey man, uh, are you a doctor? And I looked at him, I looked at my white coat, I said, yeah, man, yeah, yes, I'm a doctor. And he looked down at my shoes and he just shook his head and he was like, man, you can't afford any better shoes than that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, what Kalanji said, you know, he's making a connection based on shoes. Like there's a doctor, actually, a friend of mine, you know, is like a famous YouTuber. When we go play golf, people pull him over because he unboxes shoes. And so um, he asked me about this guy uh, who's a physician who has a, you know, a great shoe game. And so uh, some of the times we think of, or at least I do, think of uh, social media as um, you know, people you know, trying to floss and trying to um, be self-promotion. But in the other instance, it's a way to reach kids and show them, oh, you can be cool. You can have all these different Jordans. You can have all these shoes, but you can still also be a physician and be, you know, a contributing right. member of society. And so mm -hmm. I think that we have to use every tool that we have to try to get kids interested, uh, to show mm -hmm. them that, you know, this, you know, life of medicine is something that they can do um, and that it can be fun doing it as well. Great comments. Great comments. Thanks, Andrew. Um, let's see, Jordan, any anything to add? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, something that really resonated with me was the discussion about sort of being your authentic self. And kind of an undergrad, I was never a cookie cutter um, undergrad pre-med. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who in undergrad, they take all the classes, they join all the clubs. But, you know, I personally never really did that. And I think that that was the reason why I did get into medical school was because I followed my authentic journey. I followed my heart and I just did things that I thought were interesting and I just explored my passions. Um, so, for example, under after undergrad, I worked at a chemical company um, because I thought I wanted to go to grad school for chemistry. So exploring that not only gave me research experience, but it also help me understand that that was something that I didn't want to do. Um, and then after that, I also did a program um, at Dartmouth um, uh, School of Business and learning about accounting and finance and um, strategy, marketing. 
I think that that just made me a more well-rounded person. Um, and it also just made me a more diverse candidate during my medical school applications to talk about those different experiences. So I, I couldn't agree more with, with just following your heart and just doing what you enjoy. And, and you know, you'll definitely get there eventually. So. Love it. Love it. You and I have had some discussions about finance and everything else in, in Arizona. So thank you. Thank you for that. Those comments, Jordan. I appreciate it. Um, sticking with the sneaker theme and game. So I'm a big sneaker head too, Kalanji. So you'll appreciate that. Um, I'm typically Adidas and Nikes, but um, I love the acronym of Reebok. Uh, and Reebok, as, as, as most people know, particularly those that have, have matriculated in HBCUs and others, is reaching back as we climb. So I'm interested, um, obviously you all are doctors, uh, Jordan, you're becoming a doctor. Um, give me some, some opportunities or some ways in which you felt supported throughout your process to become a doctor. And then some of the ways that you're actually supporting others that are coming up in medicine. Let's start with, uh, let's start with you, Brian. So back when I was an undergrad at Alcorn State University, um, by the way, the best decision, one of the best decisions I've made academically ever, attending an HBCU, specifically that one. Shortly after arriving on campus, I didn't know anyone, but I got with a group of brothers, about 10 of us, you know, um, all from freshmen through uh, juniors. And we just stayed together, even to this day, every day I communicate with all of them via text, group chat, or what have you. And what I'm getting at is the minute that I verbalized that I wanted to pursue medicine as a career, you know, and I put that out in the atmosphere, uh, these brothers held me accountable from day one. You know, if they saw me, you know, going late to class, they were like, they'd say, you know, how are you going to get into med school showing up late to class, Brian? Like, you know, <laughs> how are you going? <laughs> so there's that, that accountability. The other thing, too, is when you put it out there, when you tell people your career plans, you know, you never know who's going to hear you. And there are going to be individuals who hear you and are going to be able to steer you in the proper directions. When I was a sophomore in undergrad at Alcorn State, uh, I had no idea about what the MCAT was. I had no idea about the process of getting into medical school. But someone heard me say that I wanted to attend medical school. Dr. Daryl Burnell, he was my microbiology professor, just heard me on the yard one day. And he pulled me to the side and said, Brian, there's this program at the University of Mississippi that you should really look into. I'll have your letter of recommendation written, you know, within the next week. You know, if you need the money to the $50 to apply the application fee, yeah, I can get that for you. We could get that way, but I really think that you should be able to do that. So fast forward, I attend University of Tennessee for medical school and every opportunity I got, I would go back to the campus of Alcorn State University and let the undergraduate students know what my experience was and what my experience was, you know, in, in, in medical school uh, as well. And I've tried to do that every step along the way. I you know for people who know me, you know, they'll find me uh, as a source of a constant smile, constant encouragement. Um, probably like to, to talk a little bit too much. I'll grab people to the side and say, hey, you know, how, how's it going? And I have no shame about it. You know, sometimes people will be like, oh, maybe you're a little bit too out there in terms of, you know, your, um, your appreciation for, for other black faces on, on campus or whatever. Can you make it less obvious? But no, that's, 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 that's not what I'm here to do. My job is to be a source of encouragement. Uh, and, and I think opportunities like this, you know, offer me uh, the opportunity to do this and really give back. Uh, uh, organizations like Elevate, Elevate Med, Black Men and White Coats, and that Student National Medical Association, all of these organizations give us ample opportunity to, to do just that. And I, it's, it's a responsibility. Um, like, um, like Andrew said a couple of minutes ago, to whom much is given, much is required. And that's what we're doing right now. Love it. Love it. How about you, Jordan? Uh, any ways in which you're giving back? Yeah, and how you yeah, were supported? Think, yeah, no, in terms of being supported, I think the only reason that I'm here right now is because people like Dr. Hardaway did exactly what he does for me. Um, just being available, um, really just talking to me, getting to know me, and, and just going out of their way to help me. That, that really is a big reason. I can name many people who are physicians who help me in the way that Dr. Hardaway helps others. So I think that just being available is, is just so important. Um, 
something that I personally am doing in medical school is um, my first year in medical school, I was a part of the Partnership for Progress program where we visited high school students and we held five workshops throughout the year with um, these high school students that were interested in careers in medicine. And um, we got medical students, dental students and nursing students to hold workshops. Um, so we had suturing workshop, um, physical um, examination skills workshop, teaching them how to listen to the heart and the lungs. Um, uh, we did an SAT workshop. So, so that really was a great experience for, for them to just get to know people who are medical students and dental students and nursing students um, while, while also allowing them the ability to ask us questions um, and just form relationships with, with high school students from a young age. So, you know, I think mentorship is, is really important and just going out of your way to be there for other people um, just, just makes all the difference. So I love it. Love it. Andrew. Uh, so I, I probably should rename myself uh, on this chat because uh, my name is Dr. Andrew Sanderson II. So I am the embodiment of you can be it if you can see it. My father was a, a, a family physician. Um, he was not one of the guys who, you know, paved the way for me in a sense that he, you know, he didn't set things up for me. He said, if you want to be a doctor, then you have to go get it. Um, and so I appreciated just his example, you know, getting up every day, going to take care of uh, people who sometimes couldn't pay him. Um, and so when I got to Morehouse, uh, one of the first things that I did was sign up for something called my rep. It was Morehouse Youth Reading Enrichment Program. And I'll tell you the joy that I got from going to read with these elementary school kids was much more than anything, you know, that they could have known that they were giving me. And so throughout my career, I've been, you know, going back to elementary schools, middle schools, talking to kids about, you know, trying to become doctors. Um, I invest my money in institutions like Elevate Med uh, that prioritize um, uh, increasing the physician workforce um, and just the health careers workforce, because you don't have to be a doctor. There are plenty of careers um, that, uh, that individuals can follow and, and find some fulfillment in. Um, I went back to Howard uh, as a way to give it back. I was I had a contract. I'm in GI. I had a, a lucrative contract in private <laughs> practice set up, and I saw one of my my friends from uh, from Morehouse. He was actually at Howard uh, doing a fellowship, and he was like, you know, we need you as faculty. And when you say those words to me, it's like you know, I got to do it. Um, and so, you know, I'm not saying that to, to, to talk about the things that I do. What mm -hmm. I'm saying is that we all have to. Put something in so that we can uh, get something out of the back end. Am I doing it selfishly? Yeah. I want um, a highly qualified black doctor taking care of me when I get old. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, you know, we have to um, remember that the investment that we make in our time and our effort, our money pays dividends over time. Amen. Amen. Well said. Dr. Cole, your thoughts? Uh, yeah. So, I think this is maybe like the second or third time, you know, I may have mentioned, uh, you know, the Stryer program that I was involved in and um, at, at Florida State. Um, I was uh, I was lucky enough to get, you know, paired, you know, with the mentor. His name is, uh, you know, Jimmy Moss. And uh, he was uh, Dr. Jimmy Moss. He had practices um, in anesthesiology and uh, critical care um, in, in St. Louis right now. And he had been uh, he had been kind of like my rock throughout uh, high school and throughout college. College is where things get, you know, real. You know, you have to go through, you know, organic chemistry. You know, you have to, you know, start preparing uh, for the MCAT. And there's a bunch of ways you can go about that and go about it in, um, in like, you know, not the most practical, you know, way. Um, so, you know, I would reach out to him, um, you know, with, with questions. And, you know, one of the key things we've been uh, kind of hitting on throughout this discussion is, you know, availability. You know, we didn't talk, um, you know, every day, or, you know, every week. Um, but, you know, when we did, you know, when I did reach out, you know, he made himself um, available. And I always really appreciated his time. And a lot of, you know, his guidance, um, you know, helped me, you know, achieve uh, achieve my milestone in terms of like, you know, kind of getting the MCAT score uh, that I needed, um, you know, to, to get into medical school, uh, getting paired with, um, with uh, you know, research mentors, other research mentors um, at the institution, which I also needed for, uh, my, my application. So what I wanted to do when I um, was in medical school 
was I wanted to give back the same way. So, you know, I am volunteered with, um, with SNMA and with, uh, with the MAPS uh, program. And, you know, I helped mentor uh, UCLA students um, who were also trying to get into medicine. And similarly, you know, we didn't necessarily talk like, you know, like every day or every week, but we made sure to meet, you know, at least about, um, you know, once a month. Um, we constantly kind of, uh, you know, reevaluated um, their goals and, you know, their career goals, their academic goals. And, um, and, and now um, what I've, you know, kind of found via, you know, um, social media is uh, I keep my social media, you know, public. I try to be like my authentic self on there. And I've had people reach out and just say, you know, hey, I've been, you know, following your journey. Um, just want you to know that, you know, I find, you know, you know, what you're doing inspiring. And, and that's literally my favorite thing, uh, favorite thing to hear. And I always make myself, you know, available to me. Hey, if there's any way that I can, I can help. If there's any questions that you have, is there anything that I can do, um, you know, to make, to keep you on the path if you want to be a doctor? And especially when I hear it um, from Black men, um, I always make myself uh, available. Right now, um, I'm still kind of in in the depths of residency, so um, I don't have uh, don't have you know a, a, a bunch of time, you know, unfortunately. But the time that I do have, um, I'm, I'm happy to give it um, to to anybody that can use it. Fantastic, fantastic. So, um, and and uh, by all means, hopefully everybody is seeing that uh, we've got a very, very bright future with just the four gentlemen that are joining me here today. And hopefully you're inspired and encouraged. Uh, so please send in some questions. Uh, we are certainly fielding some questions from the audience. Those of you that are watching live, truly appreciate your time on a Saturday. Um, that being said, I'd be remiss in asking one more question. Uh, if I could take the liberty as moderator in doing so. And just obviously this this documentary came um, at the heels or during, I think, one of the most uh, challenging times that we've seen in medicine given the pandemic and COVID and everything else that's uh, raging through society. Um, I can't help but think, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if you guys are with me, and I'm, I'm posing this to the entire panel, uh, but I can't help but think if we had more uh, African-American doctors uh, more African American male doctors that things may have been different. I don't know if that would be the case, but I've had two uh, family members that unfortunately died of COVID that I think have, could have been avoided. Um, won't 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 opine too much there. Uh, just in terms of the empathy, just in terms of the access to healthcare, those kinds of things in which uh, COVID could have uh, maybe been constrained a little bit, maybe even restrained a little bit if we had more empathetic physicians, uh, more physicians that look like like you and I. But any thoughts? I'm interested. I, I can I can jump in on that one. Um, I, you know, Thanks, I think that the disparities that we see um, in general and COVID specifically, you know, have been uh, around for a long time. Um, the inputs that make people um, have the type of health status that puts them at risk for dying from COVID were already there. So if you had access to more, a lot more physicians, perhaps, um, but I don't know that, um, that it would have changed a whole lot, except in the fact that the more physicians that you have of color that care about individuals, that they have this concordance where they open up themselves to trust, I think a lot of the misinformation that was out there could have been, um, could have been avoided. And so from that standpoint, even especially with vaccinations and the, um, the percentage of uh, people who were accepting of that, if they had, you know, black physicians who, you know, black male physicians who could uh, talk to them and explain it to them, I, I think that we have a lot more people in the community who accept it. Yeah, absolutely. I agree wholeheartedly, Andrew. Um, and, and this was a problem even before uh, COVID, right? We know from studies that black patients are more likely to follow the diagnostic and therapeutic plans laid out by other black physicians. There's a trust factor, there's a rapport factor there. Um, we see it in gastroenterology, and uh, Andrew knows this, um, uh, you know, the colon cancer screening rates amongst uh, African Americans, you know, is lower than that of our white and non-black uh, counterparts. And one can only wonder if we had more African American gastroenterologists or primary care physicians who can make solid recommendations and not necessarily convince, but educate um, uh, other African-American patients uh, about the benefits and the utility uh, of, of doing these things where we'd be uh, in 2021, uh, yep. you know, compared to you know, 1960, 1970. And we see it in cardiology, and I think we can go in all, you know, through different fields, different specialties, 
and see the same type of statistic uh, manifest itself. Um, you know, when I don't know about you guys, but when you know at the beginning of the pandemic, when um, I think it's Dr. Corbett, the African American uh, researcher who who was um, heavily involved yes. in the development of the COVID vaccines. I mean, there obviously there's a great sense of pride that uh, that resonated with me upon learning about uh, this this young woman. And then I immediately thought about you know how seeing her face on television and reading about her story, how many other Black patients uh, felt a bit of relief and were less apprehensive about pursuing the vaccine once it became publicly uh, available. So I think all of this hits back in terms of the importance of seeing, you know, faces that look like us, people who have shared experiences as us, mm -hmm. people who wear uh, Nikes, you know, to, <laughs> to the hospital and, 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 and not and not bands, you know, to <laughs> how we can all be benefited from that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. I love it, Brian. I love it. Well, well, uh, another question, and I'm sure all of you can can uh, give me some insight here. Um, you've all mentioned having to overcome obstacles. That being a physician is 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 difficult. It's complex. Um, talk to me about maybe just a, a time or two, and give me the Twitter version if you don't mind. A time or two when things were just seem like oh man this is this is something that's almost insurmountable i don't know how i'm going to overcome this and if you would just how you did overcome it and look at where you are today so uh i'll, I'll throw that out to the panel again anybody that'd like to start not all at once guys yeah no, i can i can definitely start um you know i think it's a great question and i think in medical school um well, both in medical school and practicing as a physician, um, it really tests your emotional strength, um, physical strength, um, and like, yeah, spiritual strength. And I think that it, it's, it's a really, really tough thing to go into. Um, and just being in medical school, the, the academic rigor of it, you know, people have always told me before I applied, like, you know, medical school is, is really, really hard. And I kind of just like brush off. It's like, yeah, I know it's hard, but I've done a lot of hard things in my life. <laughs> but, um, but, but really being here and just fighting for your life every single day, like waking up at the crack of dawn, seeing patients, going home, studying for hours to pass the shelf exams. It, it's this year is probably one of the hardest years of my life. But I think that something that really gets me through is is seeing my patients and and especially if there's a black patient and i walk into the room and they see me and i just see their like shoulders relax completely and like the conversation is just like with someone it feels like i've known them for 20 years when i just met them in this moment um so so i think moments like that really show me that what i'm doing is worth it and and it really just helps me push through those hard times when i'm up in the middle of the night studying so that's awesome, Joy. That's awesome. Love it. Love it. Yeah, Anyone else a, before we close? That's incredible. Yeah, that's that's incredible. I, I can think of too many situations like that, um, both in med school and residency, you know, applying for fellowship, applying for a, a job. So, Jordan, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, you know, those episodes of doubt don't necessarily go away. They decrease in frequency. But one of the main things that helped me in medical school, I was very fortunate enough to attend or, or to be in, in a class of, uh, I believe there were about 35 uh, black students in my med school class. So I had built-in support um, on day one, right? So the things that I couldn't share or did not feel comfortable sharing with other individuals, I could do that right there, you know, within, within that clique. Um, and there was constant support. And Jordan, I really, really appreciate what you said about, you know, your experiences going in to, you know, to, to see a patient and you walk in the room and they see you in their eyes, you know, get big and their shoulders slump and they're relaxed. I gotta tell you, that's one of the best feelings in the world. It's one of the best feelings in the world. And it's, you know, quickly followed by, oh, your parents must be so proud of you. <laughs> 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 Because you have that instant rapport, you know, that patient is going to trust you. They know 
the patient knows that you have their best interest uh, at heart. And that's something that drives me continuously and I suspect it will continue to drive me uh, until the day that I'm not doing this anymore. Mm -hmm. Here, here, Brian, here, here. So, well, it's, 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 oh, please go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, 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 I hope I'm going to try to be quick. Uh, <laughs> this, this is about black men in white coats. One of the hardest parts of my journey uh, was during residency. So I was at Temple. As you know, uh, it's a tertiary hospital with very, very sick patients. They have, you know, heart transplant uh, program. And so in my second year, um, I was on, it was myself uh, in the CCU, um, the cardiac uh, critical care unit. Uh, and then there were two other black men on the heart failure unit. And uh, this is a time where academics are important, right? Because it didn't matter whether you had Jordans or Vans on. <laughs> and these statistic patients, like you had to have somebody that you could talk you know, a case through. When patient was coding and, and you needed some ideas about how to save them, um, having two other black men there, one is, is became a, uh, Dan Haithcock became a cardiologist, uh, Ife Isaiah became a, a nephrologist. Um, having them there, you know, as my right and left hands uh, really got me through a tough time. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of stress in being a doctor, you know, primarily because you want to do the best that you can for your patients. Um, right. But knowing that you can trust this person and rely on them and that they, you know, are just as skilled and intelligent as any of the other residents there, um, that's something that you know, uh, always stays with me. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, gentlemen, it's about that time. I can't believe the hour has flown past, uh, but this has been very stimulating discussion. So thank you again for your thoughts. I uh, want to go to um, to Dr. Cole for any last remarks as we close. Um, just on thoughts about the documentary Elevate Med, uh, where we are in medicine. Uh, give us 30, 45 seconds of your thoughts, sir. Um, I would say that um, that everybody that wants to get into medicine um, should should absolutely do it. That we need you. Um, that medicine um, needs as many people um, like us in it as possible. You're going to face adversity, um, and you're going to get over it. The sun's going to come up, you know, the next day, no matter how insurmountable you know your challenges um, seem. I've gone through many. Everybody on this panel um, has has gone through many, and you know, and we probably have more to go through, and we're going to get through those. Um, we're going to get through those as well. Every single one of those adversities um, has a purpose. I see um, uh, a question over here, you know, in the chat about, you know, how to maintain self-care and how to keep moving forward. And I can't answer that necessarily uh, in, in, in 30 seconds, but to, just to speak to the adversity that is, um, that is uh, inevitable, you know, it has a purpose. And then overcoming that um, is, is only going to make you stronger. And, you know, when you get into those high stress uh, situations, you know, you're going to be resilient enough uh, to handle it. Um, so honored to be on this on this panel um, with uh, with my esteemed colleagues um, and I'll, I'll let them take it away. Thanks, Dr. Cole. Appreciate it. And then uh, how about you, Jordan? Last remarks. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with uh, what Dr. Cole mentioned. Um, and I just want to reiterate that you know, there's always going to be people telling you what you can and can't do. Um, there, there's always going to be haters like telling you, oh, you know, you shouldn't do that. Don't, you know, but what I will say is that if it's in your heart, just, just chase it with all you have, because you will get there one day and no matter how high the mountain looks, just, just, just keep going, no matter how hard things get and, and you'll get there. Resiliency. Love it. Dr. Hardaway. I would, uh, ask anyone interested to really be sincere and genuine in their interest to pursue medicine. Uh, it is not for the faint of heart. There are plenty of obstacles along the way that are going to try to dissuade you from doing it. So make sure that your, that your why uh, is there. Uh, verbalize your intent. Like I said earlier, when people hear your plan, when it's out you know, in the, in the atmosphere, uh, that gives people license to help you and direct you uh, and give you resources to where you want to get. I think that most people uh, do try to be accommodating and, and, and helpful. Um, seek out mentorship. Mentorship is not going to come to you. You have to ask for it. So uh, get out of your shell, you know, uh, go to, to, to people. Don't be shy about it and say, hey, 
I see what you're doing. I want to be there one day. Can you help me along the path? And then finally, be uh, continue to be authentic. Uh, do not try to conform to, to how you think uh, that a program or a particular school wants you to, to fit in that box. Be yourself because that is your that's going to be your biggest uh, advantage. And in terms of applying to med school, apply widely. I know too many people who apply to you know five or ten med schools don't get in and say you know that's not it. To me, those are individuals who don't want to be physicians. You got to apply to every med school that you can possibly think of, uh, because at the end of the, at the end of the day, it's not you know I want to be a, a doctor who trained at Johns Hopkins you know uh, University. At the end of the day, it's I want to be a doctor, and there are plenty of med schools who are going to be able to get you to that goal. Amen. Amen. Dr. Sanderson the second. How about you? Uh, thank <laughs> the last remarks. Uh, definitely, perseverance is key. Um, Every step of the journey, I doubted myself. Every step of the journey, I prayed about it, um, and you know, having discipline and 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 reaching out when you need help. I think all of those things are important. Uh, you can be anything that you want to be. You know, it's a cliche, um, but there's some a kernel of truth in it. And so you just got to keep going. So just keep going, and people got. You know, the universe will send people to help you. They'll send resources to help you if you keep Absolutely. going. <laughs> Absolutely. Love it. Love it. Well, thank you, gentlemen, so much. I'm reminded just in all of what you guys said about the five L's. That's lineage. That's lost opportunity. Um, that's the leverage that we have collectively, particularly of those that are, are, are black males in medicine. Um, and that's just um, the, the legacy that you guys are now doing for people that are coming behind you. Again, the whole acronym of Reebok. And the, the most important, I think, emotion in the, in the human race is love. And Cornell West said it best. You can't lead our people unless you love our people. You can't serve our people. You can't save our people unless you serve our people. So I really wanted to make sure that I thanked you from the bottom of my heart for your time today. Great, great, great discussion. Uh, this has been Elevate Med's um, Black Men in Medicine's panel discussion. Uh, if you like what you heard, please support us. We are on all social media platforms. Giving Tuesday is November 30th, almost coming up in two weeks here, uh, right after the holiday. Uh, we would love your support. In fact, we need your support. So thank you very much. My name is Jossie Chisley. This has been uh, Black Men in Medicine with Elevate Med. Thank you. Thank you.